Did you ever read Hemingway's classic short story, Hills Like White Elephants, and go, where are the elephants? What are these two people even talking about? What's this operation? What's the relationship between the hills and the elephants? What is the point of the story? Was my book missing some pages or something? You know why you feel that way? Because you're dealing with Hemingway, a guy whose writing is motivated by the iceberg theory. So let me show you what I mean. Here's an iceberg. All we see is the top, and that's the story Hemingway presents. That's all you get with him. But as you can see, there's way more to that iceberg under the water that we have to envision, investigate, and understand. Reading Hemingway is sort of like sitting down at a restaurant next to two people who have been there for 30 minutes and eavesdropping on their conversation. What you hear is what you get. Even though there's clearly so much more to these two people who have a relationship and a history. Now, if you think this style of writing is annoying, I get it. But at the same time, we actually write like this more often than you might think. So look at this text here. Behind this one sentence is so much passive aggressiveness, beliefs, values, frustration. Yeah? Ever done this before? Mm-hmm. Jake does it too at the end of the story. Basically, when you read Hemingway, be prepared to work for it. And that can be hard, so I'm here to help. I am appreciative that you're here, and I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel so you can continue to get help with more classic literature or writing and rhetoric. It's what I do. Okay, so why does Hemingway write like this? Well, as I said earlier, it is how life is. I mean, there's so much beneath the surface that most of us don't see. Additionally, he used to be a reporter with the Kansas City Star where he was given a list of do's and don'ts by his boss. Use short sentences, use short first paragraphs, use vigorous English, be positive, not negative. He would later say that these were the best rules he had ever learned for writing. You probably already noticed that most of the story is dialogue. There's a narrator, but he's not making things much easier to sort out. In fact, when I first read the story, I had to write down who was actually speaking because it got so confusing. The basis of the story is a couple in Spain waits at a train station drinking beer to pass the time and arguing about an operation. The man encourages the woman to have it. The woman named Jig eventually says that she'll do it, but it's a statement engulfed in apprehension since she's highly conscious of the fact that it will permanently change everything. In the end, the train arrives and we're left to wonder what they've finally agreed on. The operation to which they refer is an abortion. This was an illegal procedure in the 1920s, especially in Catholic Spain. Now, Hemingway's style is certainly sparse, as I mentioned earlier, but I do think the operation is never officially named for a couple of reasons. To give it a name gives it meaning. It signifies the gravity of the procedure on the one hand and the illegality, social shame, and stigma that it carried for a woman in the early 20th century. Allowing it to remain unnamed helps the woman feel less panicked, depressed, or traumatized by the reality of what they're seriously considering, and it gives the man license to treat it with an air of casualness. And I don't know about you, but every time I read this story, I get really annoyed with the guy because pretty much everything he says about the abortion is spoken like a man who doesn't have to endure an abortion. He tells her, I know you wouldn't mind it, Jig. It's really not anything. And after telling her how she'd feel about such a major life decision, he says that it's such a simple operation that it's not really an operation at all. In fact, he tells her that the operation is perfectly simple four times. Now, no surprise here, but this is a pretty rose-colored glass view of abortions, especially at this time. Since abortion was illegal in the early 20th century in most places, abortionists were more concerned with speed and their own protection than they were with women's health. They often didn't use anesthesia because it took too long for women to recover, and they wanted women just out of their office as soon as possible and almost no one took adequate precautions against hemorrhaging or infection. Typically, the abortionist would forbid the woman to contact him afterwards, so if you had any post-surgery trouble, you couldn't go back to him. Women who were victims of botched or unsanitary abortions came in desperation to hospital emergency wards, where some died of widespread abdominal infections. Many women who recovered from such infections found themselves sterile or chronically and painfully ill. And let's also not forget the enormous emotional toll that this could have on women. Now, the thing is, I've told you all this, and yet I would argue that abortion as a medical procedure and as a moral issue is not even the point of the story. It's merely the circumstance that forces the couple to confront the real matter, that no matter what, 
This pregnancy has permanently changed her and their relationship. Despite the nonchalant attitude with which the man treats the abortion, it's clear that Jig understands what a profound, life-altering, and permanent decision that this is either way. It's going to impact her physically, emotionally, and psychologically, possibly for the rest of her life. No matter what he says, she knows they can't go back to the way things were. His attitude, the way he approaches the matter, has forever changed her perception of him, how they'll interact from here on out, and the nature of their relationship. The fact of the matter is that the man expects the baby, Jig's physical and mental health, and her needs and desires to come at the expense for his carefree need for fun and freedom. While he says multiple times that he'll go ahead with having the baby if that's what she wants, it's often followed up by a reminder of how easy the procedure is. Interspersed with these reminders are comments like, he doesn't want anyone but her, and he's worried. It's clear that while he gives her a choice, she really doesn't have one if she wants to remain with him. Obviously, if she wants marriage, a family, a more substantial future, she's not going to get it from him. It's obvious that Jig is the more mature character of the two as she considers and weighs the decision, looking off into the beauty and the life of the nature on the other side of the railway. She says, and we could have everything and every day we make it more impossible and that this is all going to be taken away from them one day. To which the man basically responds, huh? The baby's life and the life that the couple would have if they keep it is symbolized by the environment on one side of the railway where there's a river, trees, it, you know, it's, it's lush and beautiful. And the superficiality of their lives and the abortion is symbolized in the brown, dry, treeless country, the train station and the dark bar filled with yet another glass of alcohol. And Jake goes back and forth on what she should do, commenting that the hills look like white elephants, but then later contradicting herself, saying, they don't really look like white elephants. I just meant the coloring of their skin through the trees. Jake is clearly a thinker. She's musing over the pros and cons, the consequences of either decision that she makes. So what is the meaning of comparing these hills to white elephants? Well, the white elephant is a very rare, lucky, and sacred animal in Thailand, so much so that when one was found, it was given to the king. It was meant to bring prosperity and success. But if the king didn't like someone, he would actually gift them one of these white elephants without the resources to take care of it. So you have this beautiful, rare, very sacred being that requires a lot of upkeep, but still must be revered. And it can literally eat you out of house and home if you don't have the resources to care for it. So you can see how the white elephant earned its more burdensome meaning to Westerners. In Western culture, a white elephant is a reference to an investment in something that is more burdensome or costly to maintain. And because it doesn't yield its value, it becomes difficult to get rid of. So the baby could be a burden on their time, finances, relationship, or it could turn out to be something of significant value as children and family are. It could give them meaning that they clearly lack right now. Remember, Jig says that all they do is drink and look at things. It's a pretty empty relationship and it's gotten old. The elephant is also a reference to that saying, the elephant in the room, and this procedure is certainly the elephant in the room. Now, Hemingway has earned a bad reputation for his portrayal of women in that they're often presented with less substance or in more degrading terms. But critics have argued that Hills Like White Elephants is a story that presents a woman in a better light in that it's sympathetic to the woman and the unfair position that the man puts her in. And I can see this point of view. First of all, between the two of them, Jig is given a name. Secondly, Jig's character grows in this short time, whereas the man remains unchanged. When we first meet her, she's unsure, asking questions and deferring to the man. She's thoughtful, as I've already mentioned. She's really considering this decision with the gravity that it deserves. By the end, she firmly tells him that despite what he thinks, they can't have it all anymore. And she tells him to stop talking or she's going to scream. The pregnancy is an inconvenience and an interference in this man's life. You may have noticed that in order to convince her of the notion that an abortion is easy, he says that he's known a lot of people who have done it. Are these other women that he's been with? Is this a behavioral pattern in his life? Clearly, these women are no longer around, which tells us that things cannot remain the way that they were before, as he claims. And you'll notice that while the two are presented stereotypically, like the man is rational and straightforward, while the woman is emotional and uncertain, it's obvious that Hemingway is using these stereotypes to favor the woman and criticize the man. 
he is not presented in a positive light whatsoever. Now, it's important that the two are at a train station waiting for the express from Barcelona to Madrid. This is a halfway point from one major city to the next, and they've only got 40 minutes before the train arrives, and then they only have two minutes to get on. As I mentioned earlier, the landscape and setting are symbolic for the decision that they'll need to make. There's an added sense of urgency here. Jig has two minutes to decide if she's going to get on the train with this guy, have the abortion, and keep living the way that they always have, or if she's going to stay there and keep the baby and redirect the nature of both of their lives. This is true of the actual decision, yeah? If you're considering an abortion, you don't have a lot of time to make it. Unsurprisingly, we're never told what the final decision is. This is Hemingway after all. So do you think she got on the train or not? Let me know your ideas and thoughts in the comment section below. I hope this lecture gave you a little more clarity on what's going on in this story, and I hope it helps you the next time that you have to dive into some more Hemingway. Be sure to check out some of my other lectures on classic texts by authors like Kate Chopin, Roald Dahl, Neil Gaiman, and others. And be sure to check out the audio recording that I have just made of Hills Like White Elephants. Thanks so much for joining me. Let's do this again soon.